I hadn't thought of that. Didn't think That's I was right. doing the introduction. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have a lot to say other than that, that Lucy has been in my group for a few years now and originally was working on a project related to understanding how DNA is replicated by cells and um, what can go wrong and how the DNA can get, how mistakes can get fixed. Uh, and then uh, just about a year ago now, exactly, uh, when we started talking in the lab about um, COVID and you know some of the things related to coronaviruses, uh, we had a lab meeting and talked about um, different skills that we had in the lab and whether this is something that would be useful for us to take on or not. And I asked Lucy to lead that project um, because she had really a lot of experience with looking at large conformational changes in big proteins and uh, things like that. And so she switched over from working on the polymerase to this, and we've made a lot of progress in a year. And most of this is that really that first six months where Lucy worked on it and figured out a lot of the, um, the details and how the system worked and things like that. So she's really been an intellectual lead on this project as much as I have been, and I've really um, appreciated that. And so uh, she'll tell you that story today. Thank you, Professor, for that lovely introduction. So um, yeah, my name is Lucy. I'm in Dr. Simmerling's group from the chemistry department, and we hang out over in the Lawfer Center, at least pre-pandemic days. And today I'm going to be talking about, yeah, pretty much as he said, the work that we've been doing over the past year-ish, I suppose, since maybe last February or March. Um, and that is trying to understand and unmask the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein through computer simulations, right? And that's sort of the main theme of our work is that we try to understand these biomolecular systems with computers because it's very useful. And hopefully I'll be able to convince you of that at the end of this talk. So viruses, have been hearing a lot of them in the past year, right? They are just a way to get genetic information inside of a cell and make more of them, right? So here is this kind of false colored electromicroscopy image of this green blob thing, which is a cell extracted from a SARS coronavirus 2 patient. And these yellow bud things on them are viruses. And there's a lot of them. And this is sort of what's happening at the cellular level, right? The cell is kind of swelling and bulging up as these new viruses are being made and excreted from the cell. So the viruses really wreak havoc on your system on a cellular level, you know, and it's kind of hard to see because they're so small. But if we zoom in even further, we get a better sort of picture of what these viruses look like. And it kind of looks like a sun, right? And these are two viruses now, right? One over here on the left and one over here on the right. And if I give you a little cartoon diagram to maybe better help you understand what we're looking at, on the outside, you know, this kind of blur or ring are these spike proteins. And that's where the virus gets its name because it kind of looks like a crown, right? Coronavirus has the word corona in it, which is Latin for crown. And that's kind of what scientists thought when they saw this for the first time. But inside this kind of sun blob looking thing is the actual important part of the virus, right? It's the genetic information. Sometimes DNA, in this case though, it's RNA. And that's the sort of red spaghetti noodle looking thing inside the virus. So the goal of this virus is to get this red spaghetti inside of a cell so that it can make more viruses, right? And the first thing it has to do is physically get inside your cell, right? It has RNA encased in some kind of like lipid shell. It has to break that shell inside of the human cell so that the RNA can kind of seep out. Once the RNA does seep out, it goes to the ribosome where it gets translated you know, sort of like it normally would in regular cellular, cellular processes. And that viral RNA gets turned into new viral repl replication proteins. And those replication proteins then start pumping, just pumping out new copies of viral RNA. And some of that viral RNA then goes back and gets translated again into new viral proteins, right? New spikes. And then some of that RNA then goes and serves as genetic information for new viral particles, right? The little red spaghetti in that cartoon earlier. So then new viral particles are made with the newly formed components. And the last step is what I showed you in that first slide with the green blob picture, 
where the viruses physically have to leave the cell, right? And if we kind of look at this again in more detail with more electron microscopy images, here I have this sort of picture with these noodle spindly looking things. These are human bronchial epithelial cells that are infected with SARS coronavirus 2. And you can see that some of them have these sort of bulges or warts kind of poking out of them, right? And that is not how they should normally look. That's kind of indicative of the topography that is caused by SARS coronavirus 2 as they're sort of replicating and bulging up these cells. And you can see that over here as well with this one that should be the sort of spaghetti looking thing. But down here is kind of bulging, right? It's physically swelling from all of the viruses that are being made inside of it and the changes that that virus causes. And then up here in the top right corner, right? This cell is like physically broken in half and merging with this other cell. So again, these viruses really wreak havoc on a cellular level. And if we take this little square over here and zoom in, now we're at 100 nanometers, right? Which is pretty small. It's like the same kind of size scale as the gates on like a CPU transistor, right? Like 10, 14 nanometers, we're at 100. So similar kind of scale. And all of these sort of blobs, right? These circular looking blob things are viruses. And there's a lot of them, right? They really like making more of themselves. That's all they like to do. That's all they really need to do. But for that to happen, for it to make new copies of itself, it needs to physically get inside of your cells, right? And that's sort of the process that we've been focusing on over the past year. And that happens by the spike protein. And that's this sort of crown greenish looking thing over here, the ring outside of the protein, right? The spike protein, if we zoom in, is responsible for recognizing and binding the host cell receptors called ACE2 on the host cell membrane. And after it does that, it has to physically kind of touch it and bump into it. It undergoes this weird sort of series of majestic geometrical transitions where it changes and physically pulls the viral membrane and the host cell membrane together. And that's what gets the virus inside of the cell, right? That's like the first step of infection. So without this process, the virus can't get inside the cell. Lucy, I'm sorry to interrupt. How yes. long, what's the, what are the time scales for this to happen, like to get inside the cell and then to hijack the uh, uh, that machinery? That is a very, very good question. Um, just going off of things like incubation time, I think usually it's two to four days for like an infected patient, but that's just to get detectable levels of virus, right? That doesn't tell you how long it takes a single virus to get in. So these processes are probably occurring on maybe the millisecond or second time scale. This is slow, you know, this particularly these last steps where those viral membranes have to merge with the host cell membranes. But it is definitely kind of sub second. It's just, as we'll see later, a statistical game of numbers where it's difficult, I suppose, to orient these spikes such that they're in contact with the host cell membrane if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, very much so. Thank you very much. Cool, yeah, thank you. Really good question. So Krauyam has told us a lot over the past year. It won a Nobel Prize very recently in chemistry because it's come so far. And it's kind of resolved what these spikes look like in atomic detail, right? So over here on the left, we have actual structures that people got from Krauyam experiments of the spike in these two states. Right, this first one on the left is the prefusion state corresponding to this part in this kind of cartoon diagram where it's sort of just hanging out on the viral membrane looking for ACE2 molecules. And then number two over here on the right is what's referred to as the post-fusion spike. So this is the same protein, right, the same molecule, but very different shapes. And this is all the way over here on the right after it's done its ge geometrical kind of wizardry and shifted into this sort of weird pole-like structure, right? So they're very different and we have these two structures, but we don't really have a good idea of what goes on in the middle and how it gets from point one to point two. So you might be wondering though, we have structures, 
we have a vaccine. Why do we care, right? This right here is the first 500 digits or characters rather of the Pfizer's mRNA vaccine for SARS coronavirus 2. So this is a piece of RNA. It codes for the viral spike that we've been talking about. And then we take this piece of RNA and stick it inside of this funky lipid nanoparticle that a bunch of kind of patent laws are being disputed over right now. And then we take that liquid particle with a piece of RNA in it, put it in a vaccine vial, and then inject that into people, right? And that elicits an antibody response that your body can then use if it ever does get infected by real SARS coronavirus 2 particles. But the longer this vaccine goes on, the more variants we get, and we're already starting to see that now, right? We have one variant in the, in the United Kingdom that's been making news lately, but that's not the only one. We're already seeing at least three that are rather noteworthy and a little concerning, right? So here are two sort of diagrams that reflect this. And on the top is a phylogenetic tree that represents the sort of lineages over time. And this x-axis is the number of substitutions, right? The number of mutations in that virus as it changes, right? As it evolves. And we started over here with zero, right? In this blue clade. And this was the sort of wild type SARS coronavirus 2 virus that we all started out with back last December, right, of 2019. But quickly this shot off and you get this green variant and yellow variant and they quickly kind of stack up mutations, right? So this virus has been infecting people and evolving and getting better. And if we look down here on the bottom, this kind of tells you the story with respect to time, you can see that Really, the longer this pandemic goes on, the more variants you get, which is concerning because a lot of those mutations are in that spike, right? The spike that our vaccines target. So this is sort of a cartoon of the normal process, right? Where the spike has to bind ACE2, which allows it to fuse into the host cell membrane. But antibodies stop that by physically blocking this spike molecule and preventing it from bumping into the ACE2. But when the spike mutates, it changes its shape, right? It can't change its function. It always has to bind that ACE2, but it does change its shape. And if it changes its shape, the antibodies that we've made from either vaccines or natural resistance no longer bind to it, right? And that's because the shape of that spike has changed, the physical surface, but its function is conserved. So we really would like to target and understand these motions that are conserved across not just these different variants, but different coronaviruses, right? This process right here is the same for all coronaviruses that we know of. Yeah, the receptors might be different and the parts that touch might be different, but this is the physical process that's common across coronaviruses as well as other viruses like HIV or Ebola. So we want to understand these at a sort of mechanical level of detail to prepare for more variants as well as future coronaviruses, right? This isn't the first, this is definitely the worst so far to my very limited understanding of history, but we had the original SARS and then MERS, now SARS coronavirus too. So it'd be kind of presumptuous to assume that this will be the last one. We're already seeing vaccine resistance develop Right? We have three sort of main vaccine vectors that we can use right now, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, here represented in this kind of Venn diagram. And the wild type variant and the Brazil and UK variants are covered, right? We were a little worried at first, but we've gotten results that show that the vaccines do kind of elicit good antibody responses against these variants. The South African variant, though, is a little concerning because they got substantial reduction in antibody response from these vaccines against the South African variant. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine didn't lose nearly as much efficacy, but we're watching in real time as this sort of vaccine resistance emerges and this Venn diagram could look very different in another six months if we don't roll out the vaccines as effectively as we probably should be. So longer infections equal longer pandemic equals more chance of variations that increases your chance of reinfection and gives you more chances to mutate, right? So it's this sort of vicious cycle. Now that we actually do have these vaccines out, 
we're applying a sort of selective pressure for these vaccine resistant forms as we have a sort of mixed population of both vac vaccinated people and unvaccinated people. So it's even more important to sort of understand these because the concern of vaccine resistant coronaviruses is becoming very real. Cool, so that was kind of a bummer. Just to make sure we're all speaking the same language though, I want to back up a bit and make sure that we all understand, right, what proteins are because they're kind of slippery. Proteins, just like DNA or RNA, are chains of repeating molecules, right? But instead of being chains of nucleic acids like DNA, they're chains of amino acids. And instead of being four of them, like in DNA, there are 21, right? So the language is a bit more complex, but the ideas and principles are kind of the same. You have this long linear chain of repeating amino acids. Those amino acids can form into local structures like these kind of helices or beta sheets. And these kind of small local structures then converge into bigger structures, which can then orient themselves into even bigger structures. Right, but the kind of take home message here is that they are just linear chains of these 21 amino acids. And proteins are made sort of through the molecular dogma of cellular biology, as it's called, by DNA. Right, so if you need to get any one thing out of this presentation, it's that DNA turns into RNA, which turns into protein. So all DNA is, is a code to make new proteins. And boom, just like that, we're all cell bio experts. That's all you need to know. Now, the spike is a protein, right? And here on this diagram, if we kind of zoom in, we get this sort of spaghetti looking version over here. One spike protein is made up of three copies of the same monomer, right? Of the same individual protein shown over here. Here I have kind of a space filling version and here I have a more spaghetti filling version. And these monomers have different areas, right? Different parts of the machine that are in different colors. But if you get three of these monomers together, you get one spike. And if I change this representation into a sort of space filling view, you can see that the spike is made up of this sort of green crown region, which is sort of these three bulbous things over here in this cartoon, as well as this gray S2 core. And that first green crown region is what is responsible for recognizing and binding the host cell receptor. All right, so here we have a little cartoon. Here's our spike molecule in the viral membrane and the host cell membrane up here with an ACE2 molecule embedded inside of it. <clears throat> if that spike physically bumps into an ACE2 molecule, it does so using that crown region, right? That green part up here. And we call this the receptor binding domain. But the receptor binding domain has to physically switch from this down state where it spends most of its time into the up conformation, right? So you can see over here, it's sort of hidden and occluded, but on the right, it sort of peaked, it, it peaked its head up to look for an ACE2 molecule. And if it finds one, great, it can bind to it and stick to it, and start the fusion process. But if it doesn't, then it sort of shifts back into this down conformation to be hidden again. And you might be wondering to yourself, well, why would it ever want to close, right? If the upstate is its active form, why would it want to ever be hidden? And that's because the vast majority of neutralizing antibodies that we've looked at target that region on the spike, the part that has to stick to the ACE2 molecule, right? So here are these pink little triangular blob things are your antibodies. And they bind usually to the same region of the spike that binds ACE2. And again, this kind of physically blocks it from binding to ACE2. It can't touch it, right? Because it has an antibody blocking it. And when we look at the experimental structures, that's exactly what happens, right? Here's the spike again. And here up here in gray are 10 different antibody fragments bound to this same region, right? This same part that has to touch ACE2. So the majority of antibodies bind there, but why won't they bind to the closed spike, right? Why wouldn't they just bind the spike when it's closed and prevent it from opening? Surely that would stop 
it from binding ACE2, no. And the reason it can do that is because the spike has this other funky defense mechanism just to make things even more complicated where it's covered in sugar molecules, right? These sort of gray blobs. And these sugar molecules are all different. If we switch back to this kind of green representation, all of these different colors represent a different type of sugar molecule, like a different molecule. So sugar A up here in blue is different than sugar B over here in tan, which is different than sugar C over here in orange, right? But just to make this extra difficult, these sugars don't have to be the same between spikes or even between viruses, right? So two spikes on the same virus can have different sugar distributions at this point, right? And that makes it very difficult for antibodies to target the surface of this because while this is sort of a static picture of these sugars, they're moving, right, all the time. And if we take snapshots of these sugars as they move throughout time, you get this kind of weird fuzzy broccoli looking thing, which is referred to as the glycan shield, right? A physical shield made of sugars. And this glycan shield protects the receptor binding domain, right? Over here in the up conformation, you can see it's kind of peeking its little purple head out and it's vulnerable, right? It's outside of this glycan shield. But when it shifts back down into this down or closed state, it's hidden. This glycan shield kind of protects it. So you can imagine it'd be very difficult for antibodies to get a pin down on any kind of part of the surface because it's always changing, not only in a single spike, right? These sugars can move, but also between different spikes, you have different chemistry on the surface. So that's why when antibodies bind, they usually do so on parts that don't have glycans, like this region up here. So after binding ACE2, right, the spike's receptor binding domain physically touches the host cell ACE2 receptor. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please. Yeah, just, just, just a naive question. Um, but so given that the glycan shield is protecting the spike from the um, antibodies, has there been any kind of research to try to dissolve the glycan shield or, or to, I mean, what, what's, is there any kind of, um, so that's, that's the question. It's a naive question. I don't know, because I'm not a biologist. Yeah. I'm just curious. Thanks. No, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I don't know of any papers off the top of my head that look into that, because usually I think, so here's the kind of extra compounding factor. The sugars on this spike, right? Sugar A, sugar B, all of these different sugars, they're your sugars. These come from your cells. So a lot of your own proteins have sugars on them, similar sugars to these. So any therapy that we might make that would try and target or snip these sugars off would cut our own sugars off of our own proteins as well. Now, the virus is very tricky like that. And if you express this virus in like a plant cell, you'll get plant sugars. Or if you do it in an insect cell, you'll get insect sugars. If that kind of answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, really good question. Cool. So the glycan shield, it's slippery. Antibodies have a hard time pinning it down. After binding ACE2, the crown of this spike, right, that green part that we were looking at earlier, physically leaves, right? Like it and ACE2 kind of just go somewhere else. We don't really know much about that step, but we do know that. And after it does, it leaves behind this S2 core, right? That gray region in that plot, in that figure that I showed earlier. And once we have this S2 core, this part is what's responsible for carrying out membrane fusion because it then unfolds and sort of like a harpoon physically sticks itself into the host cell membrane, right? So that's quite a geometrical transition it goes through. You know, you have this kind of compact form down here and all of a sudden it sort of extends and links itself into the host cell membrane. And to sort of carry off of one of the questions that was asked earlier, this is sort of one of the longer steps in this process. This is like a millisecond time scale step, it seems, for face off of experiments. And then after it does that, right, after these two membranes are linked, 
it then physically folds back in on itself, kind of like a jackknife, right? This bottom part down here attached to the viral membrane physically pulls up and refolds on itself. So you get this post-fusion sort of pole-like structure. But now you only have one membrane and it's up here, right? And it's the fused cell and viral membrane. This viral membrane got physically pulled up into this to fuse. Again, wild. It's physically pulling this membrane into the proximity so that they can merge. It's a phase transition, essentially. And this part, again, takes a long while. This is kinetically very slow. And experiments in influenza, I think, which show a very similar process, show that this is effectively the rate limiting step, is this refolding of your post-fusion S2 structure into this final form. And this structure right here is the one I showed you earlier, right? It's the one we have from experiments, one of the two that we like know pretty well. So we know a lot, right? We know a good deal. <clears throat> the parts in green are things that we know from experiment, right? One, two, and six, essentially. We know those for sure. We have good experimental structures. They might be missing a little, but we can fill in the gaps. We know this. Three over here, this ACE2 bound structure, we have a pretty good idea, right? We have some structures, they're not entirely complete, but we can put the rest of the pieces together to give us a pretty good idea of what this looks like. And then four and five, right? And the processes in between these are just total mysteries. We, we don't know. We make educated guesses, but that's what these are, right? These are models that we made that are educated guesses based off of analogous systems and the experimental literature. So we know a lot, but the spike is really good at hiding, right? The RBD hides the receptor binding domain here in purple that has to touch ACE2 hides behind this glycan shield. And to top all of that off, going back to this variant conversation we had earlier, the spike can physically change, right? This kind of representation shows parts of the spike that can change over time in red and parts that are conserved. And you can see the more kind of solvent exposed surfaces, right? The parts that are on the outside of the spike are red. Oop, sorry about that. And these are all parts where antibodies might want to bind, but they can't because they change. And that changes the physical shape of the spike, but it doesn't change its function. So one of the things that we are interested in determining is if we can stop that receptor binding domain from hiding, right? This first step up here, where it has to go from that down conformation I showed earlier into the upstate. If we can somehow stop it from hiding, that might make it easier for our own antibodies to sort of pin it down, right? So here we have our little antibody diagram again. Usually there's maybe only one or two or a small number of spikes that have a receptor binding domain open on the surface of the virus at any one time, right? But it's a numbers game. If we could somehow shift that equilibrium so that all of the spikes have a receptor binding domain open at any one point, or maybe even most of the spikes, the antibodies would have a lot easier time pinning that down and neutralizing the virus before it can get into the cell. So that's the goal. Experiments can tell us a lot. I've kind of summed up for you what experiments can tell us, but they're limited, right? They can see things in atomic detail with cryo-EM and X-ray crystallography, but they get snapshots. They don't give you transient events. They don't usually give you motions. They don't usually tell you the full picture. Our lab likes molecular dynamics because it can tell us things and fill in the gaps between these sort of snapshots that cryoEM gives us. It can tell us things about how the spike binds ACE2, how maybe the different variants are affected, things that happen over time, molecular dynamics exceeds that, right? So here's my molecular dynamics in three minutes or less. <clears throat> Let me take a quick sip of water. So in a nutshell, right, it simulates atomic systems over time, according to classical physics. It doesn't have to be atomic systems. I know a few people, or I know a few people that use it on inter like celestial objects, but it simulates systems over time using Newton's laws, right? 
And these are just kind of funky ways of writing force is equal to mass times acceleration. And if you have a potential energy, you can get a force from that potential energy, right? Newton's laws. Our atoms are points with mass and charge. And our potential is this kind of mathematical function that we use to define how they interact, right? And it's not too terrible looking, right? There's no like exponentials or logs. There's sines and cosines and sums, but if you break this down piece by piece, you have a term over here that keeps bonds at the correct length, right? If you have two atoms bonded together, you're not gonna have a bond length, the length of a cell. It just doesn't happen, right? Maybe in like quantum mechanics, you might get some non-zero probability, but we're throwing that out the window. We're not dealing with that. Bonds have a fixed length. We also have an angle term over here that keeps bonds at the correct angle, right? Bonds have a length, but they also have angles. We like to keep them at their right angles. It makes sense. Then we have this kind of cosine Fourier series over here. And that is, again, a fancy way of saying you can't rotate around a double bond, right? If you have double bond, it's rigid. You can't rotate around that. And that's how we do this. Then we have this sort of funky 12-6 term over here that just says atoms can't overlap. They have mass, right? If you have two points, they can't be on top of each other. They have mass. That's just nature, right? And the last one is Coulomb's law, charge-charge interactions. Again, Newton's laws. This is all very, very kind of simple physics. And if we have this potential and we have some kind of initial position, like say from cryo-EM or X-ray crystallography, we can take our potential and we can take the position of our atoms and we can calculate the force on each atom at any given point in time. And that gives us an acceleration, which then evolves velocity and gives us a new position, right? At some other point in time. And we use that position as our new initial position and repeat this process over and over and over again. And it gives us a trajectory, right? a movie of how a system evolves over time. But there's a lot of parameters, right? This is the function, but there's a lot that goes into making this function actually resemble some layer of reality. And our lab is, if you don't mind me saying, quite good at making them, right? One of the main parameter sets we use, 14SB, has these days over 3,000 citations. So it's pretty well used and people seem to agree that they like it as well. And the code that runs all of this is called the AMBER code. Our lab is one of the developers of this code. It consists of hard to get a pin down on the number, but over a million lines of code. So this is a lot that goes into making movies that resemble, again, some layer of reality. And this is kind of what it looks like. Right, it's a very large system. The one that we're working with over here is the spike with its sort of gray silver glycans moving around and it's embedded in this viral membrane, right? This lipid C. This is probably one of the biggest systems we've worked with. It's over a million atoms. There's a variety of different types of chemical species, right? There's that protein that the spike is made of. But then there's also the sugars that decorate it and they have different chemistry. They have different parameters. There's also the lipids that this virus is immersed in, that this protein is immersed in, right? These wiggling, jiggling beads on the bottom here. And then all of this, I have it hidden, but all of this is simulated in a box of water, right? If I showed the water, you, that's all we would be looking at. So it's kind of unseemly, but it's there, I promise. Then in that water, we have ions, right? Salt to mimic experiments. So there's a lot of different chemistry going on. And this is the culmination of a lot of different work from a lot of different people. And we've never really looked at a system this large. And experiments, as good as they are, can't see it all, right? This demands big computers, like really big computers for a system this large. And we've been blessed with compute computational resources from the COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium. And one of the systems that we use is Frontera, right, over at Texas Advanced Computing Center. It is the eighth fastest supercomputer in the world, has 450,000 CPU cores and 360 NVIDIA 
RTX 5000s. So it's a beast. It's a beast of a machine. It is pretty fun to run things on. If only I could play Minesweeper on it. So the experiments tell us a lot, but they're also missing a lot, right? Here's our kind of blob picture again. All of the parts with spaghetti in the middle of the blob are things that we know. We know the coordinates of those atoms. We know what it should look like. You can see parts of this blob don't have any spaghetti inside of it, which is very sad because that means that we don't know what it looks like. We know that something should be here in this blob, but we don't know what it would look like. So this wasn't a simple process. A lot of 2020 was us just building this model and preparing it to simulate. This, the gray parts in this diagram here are parts that we got from CryoEM, right? Parts of that were had spaghetti over here. But then the purple, we're missing proteins, right? Like missing loops, missing side chains, atoms that physically were not resolved, right? Almost like if you take a picture, but part of it is out of focus. We had to sort of model those parts that weren't focused into this protein based off of, again, analogous systems and experimental literature. And then on top of all of this, the glycans, the sugars, they're terrible. I'll leave it at that. They're very complicated and we had to model them in physically to try and match experimental distributions. It was a long, arduous journey. And once we had a sort of model that we can work with, we wanted to define a way that we could track that transition of the receptor binding domain. Right, so we measure an angle and a dihedral, right, a sort of pushing up and a swiveling around its axis. And we ran molecular dynamic simulations in the up and down states. Here I have plots that show the distributions in these different simulations. On the x-axis is this angle, right, as the receptor binding domain physically lifts up and down. And on the y-axis is this dihedral, right, the sort of swiveling motion it does as it opens up. This on the left are three different closed simulations, right? So the spike simulated for about 100, maybe 150 nanoseconds in the closed state. And here we simulated it in the up state, right? And you can see that they don't really move. We simulated this for about 100 nanoseconds per trial. There's three trials, right? That's about 720 hours of GPU time, but they don't move. Right, we ran this and ran this and ran this on Frontera, but it didn't move. It just hangs out in its respective states. It takes too long to simulate that transition, right? So we had to get a little sneaky with it and a little creative. We use this funky method called nudge elastic band or NEB. And that essentially biases your simulation between these two states, right? Between state A and state B. And it does that by defining a reaction coordinate. And the goal is that you run a series of linked parallel simulations in between, right? So here I have um, eight in the middle. And these simulations are all run simultaneously and they talk to each other. And they try to move around on this sort of energy landscape and settle into a minimum energy path, right? And each of these are ran again simultaneously. So this took a lot of computational resources. We ran it with 32 beads, about 50 nanoseconds per bead. That was in total about 4,000 hours of GPU wall time. So this is not something we would have been able to do with our typical resources, you know, running this on our NVIDIA 2080s. This is, this is big stuff. It's challenging. So we use that nudge elastic band method to simulate that transition, right? The receptor binding domain physically shifting from the down hidden conformation into the upstate and then back down. And this over here is kind of what that looks like on the right of the same kind of version of the plot I showed in the last slides. You have over in the downstate, this kind of basin right here, and it moves, right? The RBD moves along this angle and dihedral axis up into this up confirmation. And the reason that we wanted to do this was that we could get energies out of this. So we took that pathway, right? We took all of these intermediate structures from that pathway and broke them down into a grid, right? Which you see here on the right. And we then took each of those structures from each of those grid points and ran a simulation, about 305 
in total. We ran them for a good while. And if you've run them long enough and you're doing it correctly, that can give you a free energy surface, right? So here we have our transition as the receptor binding domain shifts into the upstate. Here are all of our independent simulations. And that gives us the free energy. It tells us how likely and how favorable the different points along this pathway are, right? And it was in line with what we would expect from reality, from what experiments have told us. And that is that it really likes being in the downstate, right? You can see here, in this little basin corresponding to the closed conformation, that's the minima. That's where energy is the lowest. It likes being there. So at the very least, this was a nice little check for us that we're doing this correctly. Our models are representative of some part of reality. We can keep moving forward, right? And one of the things that this was useful for is telling us things that maybe experiments can't or things that limit experiments. And one of the very popular mutations used in almost all experimental experiments of the spike have this mutation that stabilize it, right? And the vaccines even use this mutation as well. But it's not exactly clear the effects that this mutation has on the spike's behaviors. We know that it stabilizes it, but we don't know when we do experiments on other parts of the spike, if our results are affected at all by these stabilizing mutations. So we redid those kind of simulations. We redid that free energy calculation with both the wild type and that mutant, right? This kind of stabilizing mutant. And we can see based off of the sort of hunches that have been floating around the literature that our free energies are consistent with the idea that it stabilizes the spike, right? The free energy surface is now a lot flatter. It would have a much easier time going from the closed to the open conformation than it would with the wild type variant. So again, this was a nice little check for us saying that our simulations are working. They are a reflection. They're at some kind of reflection of reality. Let's keep moving forward with this. Let's see how far we can go, right? Because that's science. So our goal here, just to bring it back, is can we lock this receptor binding domain in this up conformation, right? Can we make it easier for antibodies to find this receptor binding domain? You can see in our original wild type, it's really unfavorable. It will pop up here spontaneously sometimes, but it does not like spending long up here unless there's an ACE2 molecule nearby. So we saw this, right? We saw this kind of motion. And we saw the kind of space in here. We thought to ourselves, could we fit a molecule in there? Could we dock something into this region? And we followed through with that. We identified a pocket, this sort of green region, near the base of the receptor binding domain. And this pocket is near a hinge that links the receptor binding domain to the rest of the protein. And inside of this hinge is a physical space, right? Is physical pocket. On the left is this sort of diagram of the receptor binding domain when it's in the down conformation. But on the right, you can see that when it shifts to the up state, it vacates this empty space. There's a pocket, you could maybe fit something there. So we ran some docking simulations with our collaborators, Dr. Rizzo and Chris Corbo over from the AMS department. And they docked something like 25,000 drug-like molecules into this pocket. And we found a couple of leads, right? We found a couple molecules that fit inside of this space. And they had the kind of chemistry that we were looking for. Right? They had charge-charge interactions between this threonine and, and this sort of amine group over here. There is hydrogen bonding between the protein backbone. There's hydrophobic interactions with this sort of ring system and hydrophobic residues over here. So it seemed to be checking all of the boxes. Right? We wanted to see what it do, what we originally wanted it to do. Would it lock the receptor binding domain in that up conformation? So again, we redid those fancy transition pathways. We redid the NAB calculations. We redid the umbrella sampling calculations. But this time we did it with that drug molecule bound in that pocket. And you can see here on the right is the free energy surface corresponding to that transition with the pocket in place. And it's starting to look a little bit like that proline one, the mutation one I showed you earlier, where there's 
ton of free energy surface is flattened out. And indeed, indeed, we were very excited because having that drug-like molecule in that pocket, suddenly the up state is a lot more favorable. The spike likes spending time in the up state. In fact, it likes spending its time in the up state about as much as it does in the down state, according to this plot. So that's nice for us because it does tell us that, yeah, it may very well be possible if you have a drug molecule that you can fit in here to lock that receptor binding domain in the up conformation. So that was about a year, a year's worth of work that I just condensed down. The next steps that we've been looking on are those intermediate points, right? The points that we're not quite as sure about experimentally. The steps in between the, mem the ACE2 binding and inserting into the membrane and then fusing the membranes, right? So we're working on this and we have a few ideas. We have a couple preliminary simulations that we're going across. Here is the virus, but it's upside down now. I apologize. But this is the viral membrane with the spike after the S1 crown leaves. And you can see it's sort of expen extending its harpoon to try and reach into the host cell membrane on the bottom so that it can pull them together and fuse them. So this is a very, very transient process. This isn't something that experiments can typically, typically get. We have educated guesses that this might happen, but we don't really know much outside of the fact that somehow the spike needs to tether the two membranes together. So that's something that we're looking at and something that we're very interested in finding out. But like I just, you may have gotten a hint from all of these free energy calculations, this is challenging, right? The struggle is real. Simulations take time. This is, like I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest systems we've worked with. It's over a million atoms. Each of these plots takes well over a thousand computing hours. We wouldn't be able to do this without the resources that we've been granted because of that HPC consortium. Glycans, those sugars, again, not something we've ever worked with in this lab. They were challenging. They took us a while to figure out. And we've done okay, right? We've done okay so far. We got where we wanted to go. We have a preprint out now on the, those free energy surfaces of that drug molecule locking the receptor binding domain in the upstate. We've gotten recognized by the Gordon Bell Prize, which is awarded for high performance computing on outrageously large systems, along with Dr. Rami Amaro and several other collaborators. So we've been doing well, but there's still a lot of gaps to fill. And the longer I suppose this pandemic goes on, the larger demand for this kind of knowledge. So this is our lab. These are the people that have been working on it. We have a ton of really talented undergraduates that have been instrumental in a whole bunch of this research. My coworkers up here in blue have been killing it. I don't know how any of us are still getting any sleep at this point. We had our collaborators at Stony Brook, Dr. Rizzo and Chris Corbo in the AMS department. And we have Dr. Rami Amaro and her group and her postdoc, Dr. Lorenzo Casolino, and I believe UCSD. So this has been a very large collaborative project. There's a lot of heads involved in working on this. And this is about where we're at right now, but there is still a ways to go. So thank you very much for your time. And attention, and I would be happy to take any questions if there are any. We should start off by thanking Lucy. So thank you, Lucy. Virtual round of applause. That's good. Um, so, so Lucy, let, let, let me jump in and ask a quick question. I, uh, I guess maybe I've got two questions. One, one a bit more physical and then I want a bit more uh, computational. So the, you, if I remember correctly, you're saying that the, the spike is spending 90% of its time in and then 10% of its time out. But the energy landscape you were showing, which if I read it correctly, it was like a six kilocalorie difference. And so yes. that would suggest it would be a larger factor. So how do I understand that uh, difference? That is a very good question. So these figures that I'm getting here are, surprise, surprise, 
guesses, or not guesses rather, but experiments, but using that proline substitution that I mentioned earlier. These numbers are kind of a reflection of the challenges that experimentalists face when they're studying these because they do these experiments with that stabilizing mutation. They get these distributions, but we don't know if this is actually what that distribution looks like. So you're right, it probably is a lot less, right? It's probably spending much more time in the downstate than the upstate than just 90%. Okay, interesting. And, and then I guess uh, on the more computational side, so. The, I mean, th these are really challenging calculations, as you as you well made clear, and it's it's tempting to look at some of the plots you've had. It's like, oh, this is this is a quantitative diagram, and uh, but clearly there are error bars associated with this. So, how do you navigate that uncertainty as you try to draw conclusions from the data? That is another very good question. So, I have only been working in this field for well, as a graduate student, five years. So I have a very limited perception of recognizing, I guess, I suppose the errors and the fundamental limitations of our methods. Thankfully, I have a very knowledgeable boss who's good at it. <laughs> but fortunately, because our lab spends so much time working on these parameters that define these kind of simulations, we usually have a pretty good idea of where the weaknesses lie. You know, and those are things like in maybe water structure or water energies or maybe interactions of the sugars with different charge groups. So there are weaknesses and we do try to navigate those, but you're right, there is uncertainty. And unfortunately, the best way to deal with that uncertainty would be to find an experimental collaborator to run experiments to verify our work. And we're working on that, but simulations take time, experiments take even longer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I jump in for a couple questions? Mm, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, first off, outstanding talk, and this is very interesting work. Um, on I think slide 43 actually is close to my first question is, um, the hinge, at least relative to the um, crown spike, looks rel relatively small. And I think on the left there, I think there's a histidine residue in the down part. Have you noticed in your simulations that there are any, um, like a small subset of really strong interactions like ionic and electrostatic ones that hold this hinge down during the simulations? Yeah, that is a very good question. There are a few things that we've looked at. Um, there's a couple salt bridge interactions. So interactions between negatively and positively charged amino acids that form whenever this goes into the down conformation and then break when it shifts to the upstate. So there are things that kind of stabilize it in that down, sh down state that make it like being there more than the up conformation, yes. Cool. Um, and then my second question was, I think it actually stemmed from a previous talk that I had seen from Dr. Simmerling, and that was that after the cap, like um, the triplicate cap gets removed and it's shooting like the spike in, into the membrane, that it only has one shot to do that. Like once the top cap was shed, that the virus was relatively inert. Um, is that still um, is that still accepted? And in your simulations, I know it's relatively early on because these things are massive. Have you noticed any difference between like an initial and final structure where one of these things shot and missed that is like a difference between like a loaded and unloaded confirmation as to why it might only have one shot? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I'll take the second part first, just because it's going to be quicker to answer. No, we haven't seen a sort of shot and then a miss in our simulations, just because, again, these take a very long time. And if we wanted to simulate it with brute force, we probably wouldn't have it by now. So we bias it with the NEB kind of that I mentioned earlier. But um, to go back and answer then the first half of your question, that does seem to be still the running theory in that if a spike loses its crown, right? It either spontaneously dissociates or it binds an ACE2 or for whatever reason, the spike does seem to kind of have one opportunity to be in proximity to the host cell membrane and do that harpooning action because experiments done on the wild type form of the spike 
now, right? Not that stabilized proline mutant. But when you mm -hmm. do experiments with the wild type form of the spike, you see on the surface of the virus post fusion spikes, which is indicative that spikes at some point must have spontaneously shed their crown, right? And then shifted to the post fusion state without doing so near the host cell membrane. So it seems that the picture being painted is that if the virus, if the spike loses its crown, and it's not adjacent to a host cell membrane, it will still want to insert that part into a membrane, but it'll do so in its own membrane, if that makes sense. Okay, so like it effectively, um, it sticks itself with the harpoon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one of the kind of running lines of research in therapeutics is trying to see if we could somehow prematurely shed this crown right? If we could get this crown to leave without binding ACE2 on all the spikes, on all of the viruses, then all of them would be neutralized and they wouldn't be able to bind ACE2. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. And again, wonderful talk. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, wrap up and uh, thank everyone for uh, coming and thank Lucy again for, again, a truly excellent talk. You, you set a high bar for this student seminar series, so thank you and uh, I wish you the very best. So take care. Bye everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lucy.